uh, brief so the committee can uh, look at the language. Um, I'll just be honest. The reason I sent the memo to the full Senate uh, was largely to say that we can and should act now on some elements of um, not only our ongoing collective work on criminal justice reform issues, um, but also additional considerations around uh, reforming the way we uh, handle law enforcement in the state. The sort of suite of issues that I presented in that note to the full Senate uh, were a reflection of work that's in progress in the Senate and in the House issues that have been hotly discussed in one chamber or the other, and that senators came to me saying they hoped it would be included for consideration. Um, and I think we all acknowledge in the, uh, that there's really a, a, a balancing act between the sort of complete exhaustive process that would normally accompany any piece of legislation that is uh, significant versus a race against time and struggling to get that right is obviously uh, the great task before you. Um, I do believe that the time is to act on some of these issues now, uh, even if it requires some creativity in the manner in which it occurs. And I'll use um, the example of the use of deadly force um, as, an, as an example. Um, there will undoubtedly be calls from the uh, law enforcement community and the attorney general's community and, and possibly others to say that it's complicated, let's delay, create a task force and so on. And I'm not here to diminish legitimate considerations of how we move forward, but I do believe we can adopt a policy now and let those same stakeholders come back in August or beyond with suggested modifications, essentially treating it like an emergency policy until such time as others come back with proposed modifications. And I, that kind of creativity would both help in terms of timing, give people confidence that there will be, that this is not a end of a conversation, but in some ways the beginning of an ongoing conversation, um, while ensuring that we don't do what happens too frequently um, either by accident or by design, which is we set forward a committee to work on something, not a standing committee, but a external task force, work group, study committee, whatever. And then fast forward six months, nine months, whatever the time frame is that we give them and uh, nothing happens. And so I believe that there is an opportunity to move quickly on some of the elements. Um, and I, totally um, appreciate the, that balancing dilemma that I described earlier about making sure that we have an inclusive discussion in the coming weeks uh, while also moving towards acting and not just talking. Thank you. I, I wanna emphasize something you just said and that is that we hope to hear from as many people as possible but we only have really my goal would be to hear from people tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday, and then vote a bill out on Friday. Um, and uh, I know that's a tight timeline for, line for the committee, but I think it's absolutely necessary to hear from as many people as possible, but we are limited in the amount of time to get this bill so that the house can at least look at it in a, in a timely manner. We, um, we, uh, these are not, many of these issues are issues that are not new. They've been going on for years um, and we've talked about them many times. So this is not new, but it is the first time that I can remember the Judiciary Committee looking at some of these issues. The, um, I, but I do caution that uh, Zoom is gonna make it more difficult to be as inclusive as possible. Um, so people should contact uh, Peggy Delaney at leg.state.vt.us if they have a uh, want to um, appear, uh, want to 
uh, have their voices heard, but they can also send the committee a, a letter, an email, whatever, in order to express their views. But again, we do want to be as inclusive as possible, but we have a tight time frame. And I'd, yeah. I'd, uh, if I might add one last piece before I sign off, Senator Sears, the, um, the temptation by the various interests is usually to come in and try to buy more time. Uh, understandably, it's their job to get the position as close to their own preferred one as possible. And by that, I mean every, every stakeholder group uh, who might be interested in a bill. And the August session per our discussion this morning with the full Senate, uh, it's not clear how long that will last. And that, a lot of that will depend on how uh, much information we have going into mid-August, how closely aligned the administration, the Senate, and the House are in terms of the full year budget. So some might say, oh, well, we'll come, you know, postpone everything until August and maybe you can work on it then and it'll give people more of a chance. You shouldn't, no one can count on that August, early September session being a place where we'll have the freedom to be working on substantial policies then any more than now which is one of the reasons why I think trying to act now is really critical yeah. um, because otherwise it could very easily be that we find ourselves in late August, everyone's in such a jag to get out that we kick the can to January. And I feel like that would be a real abdication. Uh, right. So I'll leave it there and uh, sign off and thank you. And, and by the way, next Tuesday is our day to try to finalize our response to the house's version of justice reinvestment too. Great. Yeah, it's a, I think that that bill that you guys have worked on is so important and um, touches on so many other aspects of what we do. And yeah. I, I also want to say that without, it probably won't appear in a piece of legislation, but, you know, part of the national discussion uh, under the heading defund police, um, which means different things depending on who says it, but I do want to emphasize that our investments in mental health in recent years, while not sufficient to dig out of a hole that really developed over a long period of time, is a piece of um, reducing the need for law enforcement to be essentially mental health workers on so many calls. So that's gonna be a continued part of our uh, collective work and the work of the next legislature is making sure that our, our response in mental health crisis situations uh, is, you know, aligning mental health professionals as frequently as possible with the mental health crisis that's presented. And I, I, I do not envy a law enforcement officer who has to play so many roles in the modern era uh, when they receive uh, a 911 call. And I think that um, our work on mental health really is a, a key complement to all the work that you guys have been doing in the Judiciary Committee. Thank you. You know, it's hard to understand. It's hard to focus on what was in the budget before the pandemic hit and in terms of the governor's budget. But one of the things that I was most happy about in his budget address was the addition of social workers in, in barracks in the yeah. Department of Public Safety. And I think that's that is a step in the right direction. We need we probably should do more, but I like so many other things, I have no idea what's happened to that initiative. Um, yeah, we'll have to follow up on that. The, uh, now that we've lost $400 million in state revenue. Yeah, the state police barracks that have had embedded mental health workers have, the, 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 law, the state troopers themselves have been extremely positive on the um, improvement in being able to respond uh, in mental health calls. So um, I really, I hope we can find a way to make sure that that doesn't get dropped, but um, that's a good one for us to flag for okay. Senator Kitchell to add to the 500 other things on her uh, list of things. Well, to Tim, thank you for your leadership on this. Without that, it doesn't happen. So well, let's get it done. See ya. Okay. See, See you ya. later. Bye. Committee members, any kind of opening comments anybody would like to make? I'm happy to hear them now. And then my plan was for Bryn to go through the draft and then us to have some committee discussion and begin taking testimony tomorrow morning. But if there's any opening comments from anybody on the committee, happy to hear them. Welcome back, Senator White. You missed it. Missed us. Um, we missed you. I, I didn't mean you missed us. We missed you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Came out wrong. <clears throat> Bryn, 
Um, and Peggy, if you could put up the draft on our screens, because some of the members don't have two devices in front of them. So if Bryn could walk through the draft, starting with the page one. <clears throat> Bryn, do you want me to make you the host so you can share it or do you and go through it or do you want me to do it? Why don't you do, why don't you do it, Peggy? Yep. Um, so that, that'll probably be a faster. Yep, okay. So good morning committee. For the record, Bryn Hare from the Legislative Council. I'll just wait until the draft gets posted before I begin. Can you guys see it now? Yep. Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay. But is it also on our web page? Yes, it, it is. It is if people have okay. some uh, senator. I don't think all senators have the um, enough devices to read both on the web page or the. I'm I'm reading it on my phone, but so it's great to have it on the screen. Yeah. Well, why don't we start going through it on the screen, uh, Bryn, and then if any questions, just you know, shout out if I don't see you because I've got a. Obviously, um, we're on Zoom. Go mm -hmm. ahead, Brent, please. Okay. So, um, good morning, committee. This is draft 1.2 of S219. Um, this draft has several sections that come from different places. I'll try and talk about that as I go through. Um, there are also reader assistance headings to sort of guide you through the different sections. The first three sections of the bill deal with law enforcement race data collection. Um, those are statutes that this committee should be pretty familiar with since you've worked with them throughout your work on fair and impartial policing. Section one and two are the sections of the bill um, of S219 as it came out of um, Senate appropriations. Um, so I'll just start with section one. This tasks the Secretary of Administration or their designee with reviewing all state grants to law enforcement and ensuring that the law enforcement agency um, that is going to be the recipient of the grant has complied with the race data reporting requirements that are set forth in statute, which we're going to look at in section three, um, within six months prior to the secretary or the secretary's designee approving that grant. This section takes effect on uh, January 1st of 2021. So it's got a, it's, got an effective date that's bumped out a ways. And if you turn to the next page and you see section two, it's sort of um, uh, uh, another requirement to the secretary to notify all law enforcement agencies of this new um, grant funding contingency that's set forth in section one um, by, uh, by July 1st of this year. So, um, Essentially, it gives all law enforcement agencies and constables uh, six months notice of this requirement that their grant funding will be contingent on them complying with the race data reporting requirements set forth in statute. So this section takes effect on passage. Any questions about those two sections before I move on? I guess. Oh. Yes, yeah, Senator Nick. I mean, it just seems like um, I'm not sure what if all this goes the way we want it and it gets passed. And the governor signs it. Um, there may only be days for them to do this notice requirement by July one, if if there even are days. I think this has a different effective date. This section, section two, is effective on passage. It does make the requirement um, on July first of this year. They're supposed to get out that notice by July first. So if that's if we want to make that bump that out a ways. I thought there was a discussion in appropriations about that. And hmm. I, there, there was, but the ultimate decision was that there was six months from July 1st to when the, the next section kicked in. Right. Um, but Al Alice makes a, a decent point that there wouldn't be a lot of turnaround time for the Secretary of Administration. If any. Yeah. Well, we could, we can certainly. Uh, flag that as one issue to, to resolve. Okay. Okay. I'll move on to section three then. 
This is the race data collection statute set forth in section three. Um, this requires the collection of data um, at all roadside stops and this all this language should look pretty familiar. So the changes here require some additional data collection. Peggy, if you scroll down to the next page, top of page three, <clears throat> you'll see that along with having to report um, or collect and report the age, gender, and race of the driver, the reason for the stop, the type of search that was conducted, any evidence located, and the outcome of the stop, um, it would also require law enforcement to collect data about whether any force was employed in effectuating the stop. And if so, what type of force was employed and whether the force resulted in bodily injury or death. Um, if you scroll down a bit more, and also you'll see on the next page, we'll get to that, it defines force, what force means. And that is, um, refers to the force employed by a law enforcement officer to compel a person's compliance with the officer's instructions. Um, just a quick question there. It seems as though the definition includes the term to be defined. And yeah. so in a, in a certain sense, it doesn't really define force. Right, I think that maybe a better word for what is happening here is it puts some context around what force means rather than defining the word force. Yeah, okay. Um, so staying on this page, you'll see that um, it also adds the executive director of racial equity um, to some of these requirements for law enforcement. So in subdivision two, it directs law enforcement agencies to work with the executive director of racial equity in addition to the criminal justice training council um, with the goals of collecting uniform data and adopting uniform storage methods and ensuring that the data can be analyzed. And that is because in the next subsection, subsection three. Could I ask a question about that? Sure. Does this assume that there will be a single vendor chosen um, that all law enforcement agencies will have to use? Yeah, so that's, that is how it's set forth in current law, that there is one um, vendor that is chosen by the, by the council to work with law enforcement. Um, that is how it's set forth currently. Huh, because I know that there are two different reporting systems in the state, and I don't know if this means that we're going to require people to go to, to one reporting system and one vendor. That hasn't come up in the past that I know of. Um, it does, so the, the language of the statute says that it's the Criminal Justice Training Council's job to select a vendor to work with. Right. Um, so I, I don't think it necessarily restricts it to one vendor. Um, there, it may be that the, that the council would select one vendor for certain law enforcement agencies and another for others. I'm, I don't think that the statute necessarily restricts that. So what we, I guess we've said this in the past, I guess this isn't new, but we're saying that the just the training council is the one that should choose the vendor for the particular agencies. I know that right now the agencies choose their own vendor and there are two of them. They don't, the training council doesn't choose a vendor for them. If we're talking about the reporting system that's used. Because right now, for example, they use Stillman and Valcor, and I, I, the state police have always been using Stillman, but my understanding is that they're considering moving to Valcor. Most of the sheriffs use Valcor. So I, I, but I don't think the training council is the one that told the state police that who they should choose. So I'm wondering, this is really the agency that receives the data. Um, are those are those organizations the the um, the vendors that receive the data in order to analyze it? You mean like VCIC? Well, my understanding is that the vendors. Well, this is current law, right? I I know. I'm just confused by it because well, I'm confused law. by what it means. Well, you wrote it. I didn't. <laughs> no. Well, I don't know where it came from. Yep, this this is um I believe okay. 
419, I, I, can, I can look up the, the act number. Um, this did come from this committee and the House Judiciary Committee's work on the fair and impartial policing policy. I believe um, the last act that amended it was in 2018. All right, I'll, I'll try and clear that up in my own mind. So I, I don't, we don't need to spend any more time on it all. When I said you wrote it, I meant we wrote it, by the way. Yeah. We, we went through, the, I mean, it's all current law, so I don't know right. if that's, that's something that needs to be changed. We certainly can change it. I'd just like to hear from the training council and the, the yeah. agencies about what it really means, because I might be confused by what it really means. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so in subsection three, it talks about the, this vendor again, the vendor that is um, tasked by the council with receiving the data in order to analyze it and make it public. Um, and the way the language is currently written, it provides that that vendor chosen by the council receives the data unless that vendor is unable to continue receiving the data. Again, this is existing law. You can see it on line 16 and 17. And it changes um, what is existing law provides that if the vendor is no longer able to receive that data, then the data goes to the Criminal Justice Training Council. And it changes that from the council to the executive director of racial equity. So again, that's a little, it's a little confusing, but if that vendor chosen by the council is not able to continue to receive law enforcement agency data in order to analyze it and make it public, then that data would go to the executive director of racial equity. So if you scroll down, and there, again, at the bottom of the page there, there's, a, there's, it's, there's an additional requirement that that data has to be posted in a manner that's analyzable and user-friendly. And then if you scroll down, scroll down a bit more, it adds an additional requirement to the receiving agency um, to report that data annually to the General Assembly. So either the vendor chosen by the training council or the executive director of racial equity would be tasked with reporting that data annually to the legislature. Bryn, can I throw in a question? The executive director, is that a limited time position? Yes, it is. I believe it's a five-year duration. Um, oh. So I believe there are four more years. Okay. I can, I can double check that though and confirm. So moving on um, there in subdivision five, there are lines three to five is that context around what force means with respect to gathering data about use of force. And that's it for section three. Can I ask a question? Well, of course I can. Um, the question is on use of force and that definition. If an officer uses um, uh, let's say it's a situation and the officer uses force that does not involve restraint, physical restraint, but um, I don't know, uh, but taser, um, other forms to restrain, is that included in that use of force? So, Or is I... it just physical restraint? That's what I because force can take many avenues. The, the idea here was physical force. So I think that we do have a word missing in that subdivision five to make it clear that force um, would refer to any physical use of force that would be used to compel a person to do something. So it may take the form of uh, a restraint of some kind or the use of, a, of a, some kind of a weapon or or just uh, grappling physical force. But it wouldn't necessarily mean <clears throat> throwing a um, person's driving and they want to stop them. And we've had cases where they've thrown those spikes into the road. That's not force. I don't see that as being um, physical force, but if you wanted to include that, we could certainly- No, I, I'm just asking what, you know, <clears throat> is it clear? And, and I think the word physical probably would help. I think that without the word physical, that would I would read that um, sort of con contextual language to include spikes or some other um, sort of methodology of compelling <clears throat> compliance. Um, but without, but with the word physical, I think that would be excluded. Okay. And Bryn, um, is it 
right to assume that that would include the use of canines? In other words, um, you know, the canine squad is called, and in addition to using them to locate drugs, sometimes law authorities do use them to um, compel actions on the part of the people um, that are the object of the stop. Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I, I think intimidation tactics, I don't think would be implied um, by physical force. If that's what you mean, like having a dog at the end of a short leash, whereas if the... You know, I think it should be. Yeah, I guess I'm getting into a, you know, you called it intimidation. I'm thinking also of, you know, the Rodney King uh, beating in Los Angeles. Um, the, the police afterwards said that they had used their nightsticks in what they called the approved come along manner. And that phrase has always stuck with me. So the idea that you can use a, a baton in a, in a come along manner to compel somebody to, to move it in the direction you want, could be a baton, could be a dog. Um, but it seems to me whether they make contact with you or not isn't the issue. It's are they using something that leaves you no choice, but to to do something. Yeah. You know, you bring my my image of um, and this is way back to the '60s, but uh, Bull Connor was the chief of police, and I think it was Birmingham, Alabama, who sicked a group of a dog on a protester, and that picture was so Im embedded in people's um, minds that it went, you know, around the country in newspapers. Obviously, we didn't have other forms and on television, but that picture still is in my mind from the 1960s when that was done. And that certainly the, the dog was, in that case, um, trying to compel the protesters to stop. I agree with, I think maybe we want to make sure that any any effort to intimidate would also be included in use of force. Could it, uh, is it opening it too much to say, shall refer to the force employed or threatened by a law enforcement officer? Because if if you take out a baton and you and you raise it to somebody's head and then they do what you want, we would want to know that uh, as much as we would want to know if they actually struck them, I would think. Yeah. So during a during a normal stop, an officer doesn't doesn't threaten you with physical force, but there's a level of ex escalation where they do, um, where where they say, um, you know get out of the car or I'll drag you out of the car or something like that. Um, so there's a there's an area that I'm looking to have included, maybe intimidation tactics, maybe threatened use of force, or, or maybe we detail the things we're talking about, batons, dogs, uh, et cetera. Let's... Um flag that for um, future discussion. Um, but I think it's a, a point that, so <clears throat> at this point, we're trying to get information about the use of force. And I, I think all of us would like that information about what type of force is being, or what type of tactics are being used to get the um, person to comply with the officer's instructions. Okay, right. so I've got that flagged. I'm gonna yeah. go ahead, if we're ready, I'll move on to the next section. Yeah, right. section four. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator I'm, Nicka. I'm a little bit mixed up, Bryn, from when you, you were talking about section five, do we have different numbers than you? I have that as- No, she's talking about five on line three of page four. Sorry, subsection, subsection five. Oh, okay. Language we were just looking at on page four. Okay, thank you. 
Now we're on to line 12 of, of page four. Right. So the next section of the bill, section four, is a statewide law enforcement policy on the use of deadly force. <clears throat> and much of this language is drawn from uh, a California Assembly Bill number 392 as it was introduced um, in 2019. Um, so essentially what this section does is it sets forth, um, it creates a statutory statewide policy regarding um, when it is appropriate for law enforcement to use deadly force in its interactions with, with uh, civilians. So um, bottom of page four sets, starts out the definition section. This is a pretty important section because the policy, um, the important segments of this policy will refer to these words. So I'm just gonna go through those um, first. So deadly force means any use of force that creates a substantial risk of causing death or serious bodily injury. And that includes the use of a firearm. Improper restraint, um, you'll see this could, defined in the bill. Could I ask a question about the discharge of the firearm? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. So if, uh, if somebody shoots, is trying to get the attention of people and shoots in the air, is that a discharge that would be considered deadly force? I think if it is um, a discharge of a firearm in a way that creates a substantial risk of causing death or serious bodily injury. Um, so that would, if it were sort of straight up into the air, I'm not sure it would create that risk. Whereas okay, so it's modified by create, the creating the yes. substantial risk. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, so the second definition is, uh, is improper restraint and you'll see this a few different times in the bill. Um, means the use of any maneuver on a person that applies pressure to the neck, throat, windpipe, or cartoid ar artery, carotid, sorry, carotid artery, <laughs> <laughs> that may prevent or hinder breathing, reduce intake of air, or impede the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain. Um, moving on if to you, the next. If you could just flag that, I, I, some might argue that um, other restraint procedures can cause serious injury, not, may not be death, but I know that um, doing certain things to the spine can call, cause permanent paralysis. Um, so we may want to, um, I, I, I get, it's been so long since I had my restraint training. Um, I probably ought to get an update just so I know an idea about how it's done properly, but um, there is um, there is a concern about any form of restraint that it not also uh, result in permanent bodily injury, like paralysis or something of that nature. But this is good, um, but I want to flag that too for perhaps there'll be discussion further about that. Okay. I know that um, we also have the, it may want to look at the suit that was filed by the um, Vermont Protection and Advocacy, and I believe the Defender General's Office regarding Woodside restraints. And Judge Crawford has several rulings regarding restraint in that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so the top of page five, the imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury definition um, is based on the totality of the circumstances when a reasonable officer in the same situation would believe that a person has the present ability, opportunity and apparent intent to immediately cause death or serious bodily injury either to the law enforcement officer or to another person. And it um, sort of limits that by saying it's not merely a fear of future harm, no matter how great the fear and no matter how great the likelihood of the harm, but it's um, a threat that from appearances must be instantly confronted and addressed. So Bryn, if I could just stop there. So, you know, we've all seen 
endless video of um, law enforcement officers, usually um, or almost exclusively white, confronting um, black men. And often in court, part of the defense is that the defendant is a large person physically. And that's used sort of in the way this definition works. It says, um, the ability, opportunity, and apparent intent. So let's say an officer is six inches shorter than the person that they've um, that they're facing. So the argument could be made by a defense attorney for the officer that the suspect had the ability, and cuffs were not on yet, so they had the opportunity, <coughs> and then if they take one step toward the officer, even though their hands are empty, they have no weapons, or maybe their hands are up and they take a step toward the officer. I could see a defense attorney arguing that all three of these conditions are met in that case um, if, if one took a, a you know, kind of expansive view of them. So I, I'm wondering, is there any way to tighten that a little bit? I like the language that follows it a lot because the defense is usually well, I feared for my life, and so I was freed to do anything I wanted in terms of responding to what I feared was a threat of bodily injury. But can you just talk about that uh, for a second? To what extent does the, the physical size of someone and the fact that they could theoretically win a physical fight with the officer allow the officer to use force under this? You know, I think that's a great question. Um, I do think that the second sentence is, in, is intended to, um, to say that the, the fear of the law enforcement officer is not what matters. Um, it's whether or not a reasonable person in the same situation would have been threatened in a way that um, must be instantly confronted and addressed. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it does rely on the reasonable officer standard, which, um, <coughs> which means that the officer's subjective feelings are not what is to be considered, but rather if a reasonable person in that situation would have felt the need to use, um, would have felt an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. But I do, I do think that what you're, what you're raising is, um, is an issue that, that people have been grappling with. So um, it's really the apparent intent is the, well, the actuating thing because the other two could you could claim them in many almost all circumstances in fact the rodney king um incident which i referenced before the officer's defense was that even though it was all captured on video and even though he was restrained and even though he had been beaten many many times at certain points he moved aggressively even so but they were off camera and so that justified further force. The, um, the, um, this is actual California law or the law that was proposed? No, this is the law as it was introduced. Um, I have, I don't, I think that actually this definition remained the same, but I would need to double check that. Um, yeah, could you, and there may be some experience there, but I'm also thinking that if an officer, for example, uh, you, Phil used the description of a um, of a large person, but what about if the person has a firearm and they're firing at the officer? That would be the totality, correct? I mean, I'm thinking of the Arlington situation where officers were confronted with a person shooting at them. Yeah. Um, yeah, so totality of the circumstances is defined a little bit further down. Arlington, Vermont, for those that may be listening. <laughs> So it Go means all, all facts known to the law enforcement officer at the time. And that includes the conduct of the officer and the subject leading up to the use of deadly force. So um, I think that's an important thing to note is that, <coughs> that it includes the, the officer's conduct um, leading up to that use of force as well as, as well as that. If you could check the California law and maybe they did change that definition when they 
when they yes. passed it, but um, yeah. that would help. Sure. Um, so we've gone through the uh, totality of the circumstances definition. Law enforcement officer has a pretty broad, um, this is how we typically define law enforcement officer when we're looking to go broad. Um, so I'll move on to the statewide. Does that, in, does that include game wardens, members of the um, Department of Motor Vehicle Force, uh, so it, constables, everyone? Yeah, I, can read all, I can read you the list. It includes a member of the Department of Public Safety who exercises law enforcement powers, that's Vermont State Police, a member of the Vermont State Police, a Capitol Police officer, a municipal police officer, constable who exercises law enforcement powers, a motor, motor vehicle inspector, an employee of the Department of Liquor and Lottery who exercises law enforcement powers, an investigator employed by the Secretary of State, a Board of Medical Practice investigator employed by the Department of Health, an investigator employed by the attorney general or state's attorney, a fish and game warden, a sheriff, a deputy sheriff who exercises law enforcement power, a railroad police officer, or a police officer appointed to the University of Vermont's Department of Police Services. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Okay, so the um, section B is the statewide policy. This sets forth sort of some broad statements about what the statewide policy is on um, the use of deadly force. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to, I can go through it sort of. No, I, we can read it. I, uh, I think we should change color of law. And my, my thinking there is it's a, it's a kind of uh, painfully ironic uh, phrase given what we're trying to deal with. So I think it should be under the auspices of the law. Yeah, we could also use under authority of law, which is what we use um, yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. This is how valuable it is to have an English professor on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I got professor of English, is that the proper title? Yeah, I respond to anything at mealtimes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, good pickup. 919. Yes, so law, this provides that law enforcement officers may use deadly force only when it's necessary in defense of human life. And in determining whether that deadly force is necessary, it directs officers to evaluate each situation in light of the particular circumstances of the case and she'll use other available resources and techniques if reasonably necessary or if reasonably safe and feasible to the objectively reasonable officer. And we will get more into that. There, there's some more um, language about when it's appropriate to use deadly force in the second, in subsection C, which is a little further down. Um. So um, sub, subdivision three says that law enforcement has to um, evaluate carefully and thoroughly every time they use force in a manner of, that reflects the gravity of their authority and the serious consequences of the use of force by law enforcement in order to ensure that their use of force is consistent with law and agency policy. Uh, there's a, some grammatical trouble there. You know, I'm in New York. And... Bryn. Yes. It, it now says in order to ensure that officers use force consistent with, uh, oh, that officers use force consistent with law and agency policies. Got it. Um, subdivision four provides that that decision to use force um, has to be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation. Again, saying that it's not a, about the subjective experience of the officer. Um, based on the totality of the circumstances, again, all the facts known to the officer at the time, rather than with the benefit of hindsight, and that that totality of circumstances accounts for occasions when officers may be forced to make quick judgments about using force. So unless there are questions there, I'll move on to the actual use of force. Could, use of could I just ask a question here? So in every other instance, we've talked about deadly force or excessive force, but starting with um, the section that says the decision of a law enforcement officer to use force, uh, have we changed the um, 
the standard here because in everything else we use either deadly or excessive and here we just from there on out we just use force use of force so under b the um the statewide policy it mm -hmm. talks sort of generally about use of force um the if you if you look back on page five the authority to use physical force is a serious responsibility that shall be exercised judiciously Mm -hmm. in, in subdivision two, then we talk about when it's appropriate to use deadly force, only when necessary okay. of human life. And then three and four on page six, again, go back to just the use of force. It's sort I see the section is sort of saying, doing some broad brush policy about when it's appropriate for law enforcement to use force generally. And then okay. the next section, we get into use of deadly force. Okay, thank you. So subsection C, and now I'm on page six, line 14. Um, so this sets out the sort of specific parameters about use of deadly force. Um, one says any law enforcement officer who has reasonable cause to believe um, that a person to be arrested has committed a crime may use objectively reasonable, reasonable force to affect the arrest, prevent escape, or overcome resistance. Again, that's sort of a general statement about when the use of force is appropriate. And then two says that a law enforcement officer is justified in using deadly force only upon, sorry, an office, a law enforcement officer is justified in using deadly force upon another person only when the officer reasonably believes based upon the totality of the circumstances that such force is necessary to, um, for one of the following. And now I'm on the top of page seven. Brent, can I stop you again, go back to line, um... Let's see. Oop, just got skipped. So if you scroll up, Peggy. Scroll yeah. up a little bit, Peggy. Uh, one more scroll up, please. Thank you. Um, any law <laughs> any law enforcement officer who has reasonable cause to believe that the person to be arrested has committed a crime suggests that if an officer pulls up on a street corner and is suddenly approached by someone out of the blue who is threatening to use force upon them, um, I'm thinking that doesn't quite fit within this description because they not necessarily um, have committed a crime. It's past tense. And I'm just rolling through my head. There, there are situations where an officer, for instance, goes into a crowd and all of a sudden is faced with some uh, act of an individual that may be threatening to them in some fashion. And I'm, I'm trying to see how that fits within this description. I don't think it does. Joe, do you mean it should also include someone who seems imminently to be about to commit a crime? Well, I think the actual commission of a crime is not the concern. Mm -hmm. The actual threat of force upon the officer is what we are trying to address. And so, you know, you, you can't um, be dealing with this because the person has simply uh, shoplifted or passed a $20 counterfeit bill. The actual thing we're addressing here is whether or not the officer is in a reasonable uh, position of being harmed as interpreted by the rest of this language. So I, I'm, well, I don't know I, if that's dealt with elsewhere. I, uh, I read this a little differently. I, I read it that this wasn't so concerned with force against the officer, but rather you have somebody who's committed a crime. Are you allowed to use force if they won't get into the car, if they won't present their hands for handcuffs. Um, you see what I mean? Yeah, I see what you mean, but I, I, this section is called use of deadly force. Yeah. And I, I don't want to exclude a situation where the person is not necessarily subject to an arrest for a crime that has been committed because you're effectively saying that the law enforcement officer is prevented from using deadly force, unless I haven't gotten to another provision on this scroll down, which I, drives me crazy when somebody else is scrolling down for me. 
Um, Joe, you can you can go to the committee webpage and pull. Yeah, I, I was there, and for some reason or other, it zeroed out on me, and I don't know why. Um, but the bottom line, Bryn, for you is, is there another section under use of deadly force where the officer has the ability to repel an aggressive, uh, yes. potentially deadly act upon the officer? Yes, okay. that's where it's, that's uh, throughout the remainder of this section. Okay. I, d I understand that, that it's a little strange saying that language right below the subsection use of deadly force since um, it's not talking about deadly force. Um, yeah, I, I guess I would, the first thing I would have put under this heading of use of deadly force is the officer's <laughs> ability to use force when threatened with an actual aggressive action yeah. upon themselves. And then I would talk later about a crime that has been committed and what authority do they have to use deadly force in the point of trying to arrest someone. That may just be my preference on how I would um, list this, but Bryn, let me see how it comes out in the rest of it. If, if I could just go back to, Joe's got me thinking about whether I'm reading objectively reasonable force uh, correctly. So um, as Joe notes, there have been a number of high profile cases where um, usually black suspects have been followed. They, let's say, cross the center line, don't use their blinker. Very, very technically, they have committed an offense, but then the amount of force that's used against them can escalate to deadly force. So the person is, in effect, being uh, killed by an officer because of an extremely minor offense. So I read objectively reasonable force as uh, a kind of scaled uh, consideration. In other words, uh, I read that to be saying you could not kill somebody who um, didn't use their blinker uh, because they wouldn't get into the car and then you used force to get them into the car and in so doing, you wound up um, ending their life. Can you speak to that? Just for a second. Well, I see that I see um, sort of two things in what you're talking about. One is whether the crime that was committed um, influences whether uh, whether the use of force to effectuate that arrest, um, how that how that sort of leads uh, an objectively reasonable person to um, decide how much force should be used in effectuating that arrest or um, if a person who commits a nonviolent offense, like not using their, you know, it's sort of a, a very minor offense, like not using a turn signal, who then resists arrest, does that make the reasonable, objectively reasonable force necessary to effectuate that arrest? Does that change that calculus? Um, and I, so I sort of see it as, as those, those two, there, there are two questions there. and. Um, I'm not sure that I'm the right person to answer how that should be, how that should, what the policy should be. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm responding as recently as this morning on my news feed. There was a story about uh, a, a delivery person for Amazon, an African American delivery person who parked the wrong way on a street, delivered the package, and as they were getting back into the truck were tackled by police officers and arrested for parking the wrong way on the street. So um, speaking only for myself, by the time we're done with our work here, I hope somewhere in the draft, it will address this sort of vastly disproportionate use of force when considered against the offense for, to which the officer is responding. Um, so maybe that's not in the purview of this bill and maybe it is, but. Um, I think it is in the, I mean, it's in the, that is part of the calculus when determining what is reasonable force. Um, if you look at, you know, Supreme Court case law about police use of force, when they talk about a reasonable person in that situation, one of the guideposts um, is what was the crime that was committed. Okay, um, maybe, maybe objectively reasonable Cat gathers that in then. Well, it brings up the simple question of, of George Floyd. Should 
that particular alleged offense um, justify the use of deadly force? And I don't know how to categorize every single crime we have and it may at the end of the day have to be left to the jury to decide whether it was reasonable under the circumstances. You know, that, that's an interesting, this whole discussion. And I, I would, I do plan to hear from law enforcement, um, but I know generally there's a policy on, you know, high speed chases on all kinds of other things that law enforcement does based upon the criminal act. So a $20 counterfeit bill is much different from somebody um, threatening a police officer with a firearm or some other behavior that um, that's where I um, so I I hope where whatever we pass reflects that so shall I move on to subdivision two that this is the subdivision two talks about the policy regarding the actual use when a law enforcement officer is justified in using deadly force. Yes, please. Okay. <clears throat> so two provides, again, we use this objectively reasonable standard. Um, only when the officer reasonably believes based on the totality of the circumstances that the force is necessary to um, achieve one of two objectives here. The first is A, defend against an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury, either to the officer or to another person, or to apprehend a fleeing person that the officer reasonably believes will commit um, another or will cause death or serious bodily injury to another person unless that officer immediately apprehends the person. <clears throat> so um, again, so, I'll just go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I, all, all of these things trigger memories of videos over the last few years where the end of the video is uh, usually a young black man being shot. And I'm thinking of several where there's a minor traffic offense, the person gets out of their car and runs and the police officer shoots them in the back as they're fleeing. So I just want to make sure. So that, a, right, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. So subsection B, when it talks about a fleeing person, there are a couple of limitations here. The first is that the person had to have committed a felony. The officer has to reasonably have believed that the person committed a felony that threatened or resulted in death or serious bodily injury. So it has to be a violent, the officer has to have okay. reasonably believed that the person committed a violent felony. And that officer also has to reasonably believe that unless the person is immediately apprehended, that person will cause death or serious bodily injury to another person. Okay, great. So that's two different ways it bars what I talked about. Right, right. so the fleeing, yeah. <clears throat> so, Brent, go ahead, sorry. Joe. No, no, go Brent, ahead. I'm, I'm curious as to why this section comes after the previous section, this sort of, to me, looks like the first section you should be looking at under the heading use of force. You know, um, this may have just, I may not have read it carefully enough. Um, this is how it was laid out in the California version. So it's how it's laid out here, but. I would just think about it. Around. Uh, uh, that's a good point, Joe. But I, you know, the, the image I have is when a police saw, the two things I wanted to mention. One is an image that we all, uh, a tragedy that happened in Montpelier during um, where the young man was shot and killed. Um, he was at, at Montpelier High School. So there was an imminent threat, obviously to students, et cetera, that they saw. But on the other hand, the law enforcement wasn't aware of what type of weapon he has. So there is a shooting there. Um, clearly it was a mental health issue and um, the, the person was killed. But then one of the things that I know comes up is the investigation. 
and who does the investigation into these. So do we get to this later? Well, that is one of the things that um, in we have in the um, in, in GovOps around the uh, training council and when they do investigations and how they do it. And it's been pretty well, but, clearly laid out about how that happens. And we're going to look at but, that to see if it can be beefed up a little bit. Well, there's a lot, I've heard a lot of concern about it being, you know, the investigation into the shooting being done by a state's attorney who, you know, I'm not demeaning in any way state's attorneys, mm -hmm. but they have relationships with police officers. They rely on police officers for testimony. They rely on police officers for reports. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they rely on police officers for charging advice and other things. And so um, it, that would be one concern I know many people have. And this is not just in Vermont, this is nationwide where um, so so often, and even uh, in the case in uh, Minneapolis, where uh, the attorney general has taken over, his discussion of how of how it went, the investigation, um, he ended up taking over the investigation. And down in Georgia, with the case of Aubrey murder, where the local state's attorney recused himself and then the next state's attorney in the neighboring county recused himself and so on the attorney general ends up with it so, just a thought i i don't know if that's a government ops thing or so later in the bill we do talk about um conduct that would lead to a uh, an investigation by the criminal justice training council okay uh, but as right. maybe i should maybe i should let you keep walking through the bill. <laughs> well, it doesn't, we don't, this bill doesn't address how that investigation um, is undertaken by the council. Um, so we're not, we're not going there. But as yeah. Senator White mentioned, that's typically something that government operations can be works on. Yeah. Can we get back to the bill? And um, I, we've interrupted you several times, Bryn, and there are good questions, good comments. Could you remind us where we are exactly? <laughs> Sure. So we just went through that subdivision two that talks about when um, the use of deadly force is justified by law enforcement officers. Yep. So now I'm in subdivision three on page um, page seven, line seven. Okay, <clears throat> good. Thank you. So this provides that a uh, law enforcement officer, when it's feasible, prior to the use of force, make reasonable efforts to identify him or herself as a law enforcement officer and to warn that they may be using deadly force unless the officer has objectively reasonable grounds to believe that the person is already aware of those facts. The following subdivision four provides that law enforcement shall not use deadly force against a person based on the danger that that person poses to themselves. Um, and then it provides a qualifier if that object, if an objectively reasonable officer would believe that the person does not pose an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to somebody else. Is that clear? Yep. Yep. Um, five provides that a law enforcement officer who makes an arrest or attempts to make an arrest does not need to retreat or desist from their efforts. Um, if the person resists or threatens to resist. Um, law enforcement officer shall not be deemed an aggressor or lose their right to self-defense by the use of objectively reasonable force. Um, and that ob objectively reasonable force is talked about in subdivision one and two. To affect that arrest or to prevent the person from escaping or to overcome resistance of the person. And then um, a clarification that retreat doesn't mean tactical repositioning or other de-escalation tactics. Lastly, a subdivision six, I'm on the top of page eight, line four. Um, this is not a part of the California um, bill as it was proposed, this is new language. A law enforcement officer shall not use an improper restraint on a person for any reason and law enforcement officers have a duty to intervene if they observe another officer using an improper restraint on a person. 
So Bryn, very quickly, um, subsection five, line 17 on page seven, mm -hmm. um, need not retreat or desist from his or her efforts by reason of the resistance or threatened resistance of the person being arrested. Um, so that seems to cover a lot of ground. Um, in other words, somebody says, uh, I don't want my car searched. You don't have the authority to um, make me get out of my car. Mm -hmm. um, what are the limitations on that first sentence? Could I ask where we are? We lost our power and I got booted out. It's and I page, just page, back. page seven, line 17. Thank you. So in other words, it, it begins to remind me of um, stand your ground laws. Um, in other words, I'm empowered not to retreat and I can move forward with the arrest regardless of any resistance. That seems to cut against other pieces of the bill. Right, I, this is an interesting, this is interesting language. So the person is still bound by the other parts of the policy, meaning that objectively reasonable standards still applies to any use of force that's employed yep. by the officer. But, um, you know, I, I think you're identifying where that objectively reasonable standard is informed by what the person is actually, um, what the officer believes that the person has done, what criminal activity the officer believes the person has committed. Um, so I, I would say that the rest of the policy still applies. So I think that the intent of this section is to say that if a person does resist arrest, the officer may, does not have to um, retreat as long as they are still using objectively reasonable force in, in effectuating that arrest. Does it say the officer can, I mean, basically use proper restraint? Thinking of that type of thing. Yes, I mean, at the right, this section defines what it doesn't, what it doesn't, doesn't say the officer can't use proper restraint to uh, arrest the person. Right. Any rest, any restraint that falls outside of that definition of right. improper so restraint. I, I don't. I'm not sure. And we'd certainly look at it more and hear from witnesses on it. But I think it. It just says you still have a right to detain the person to provide reasonable restraint as long as it follows the the proper. Um, I don't think it says. You, I mean, I know. When somebody refuses to allow them to search a car, they uh, there's been some cases on this in Vermont where somebody refused to let them search the car, and they have the they get they detain the car until they can get a search warrant. And, you know, uh, right. there was a case out of Rutland County, I believe, on that. Yeah, I understand it's trying to balance the uh, the rights of the officer and the rights of the accused and. This is the section where it seems we're laying out the right of the officer to continue with the arrest, even if there's resistance. Um, and I guess you have to assume that that's in the context of the other pieces of the right. bill. I just, I just, again, I'm thinking about if I'm defending an officer in court, I might point to this sentence and say he had no, um, I, there was no reason for him to retreat. He has the right not to retreat and he has the right not to desist, which means he has the right to move forward over any resistance. Um, so maybe, uh, I don't know, is yeah. there a, yeah. I, I do see this language as um, sort of being drawn directly from that balance, that fourth, that Fourth Amendment of the Constitution balance in the government's interest in providing effective law enforcement yeah. um, with the interest of the person, the person's Fourth Amendment right to be free of unreasonable search and seizure. I, so I think on, on line four of page eight, a law enforcement officer shall not use an improper restraint on a person for any reason. Qu clearly, um, 
while the law enforcement officer doesn't have to retreat, they shall not use an improper restraint. Right. Again, you know, as I said, that the any force employed is the person is still the law enforcement officer is still bound by the rest of the policy, which requires that any force that they employ has to be reasonable. Let's um, let's uh, we're getting. Um, can we go on to chapter uh, section five? Dick, before you jump there, that um, section you just referred to, I'm looking at lines four through six on page yeah, eight. Right. I would take that second sentence and make that a number seven because it's talking about a different individual just for logistics purposes. Okay. Probably a good idea. Okay. That was not part of the California law, correct? No. That's correct. Then we get into improper restraints on professional conduct. Right. So as I mentioned before, um, we do talk about unprofessional conduct in the bill. Um, Section 5 <clears throat> amends this subchapter 2 um, of Chapter 151, which governs the Criminal Justice Training Council. So you'll see, starting on line 11, these are the definitions set forth about what um, constitutes unprofessional conduct. And I've included this category A conduct for, you, for, for your reference to see what category A conduct includes. No changes are made to that. But if you scroll down um, to page nine, um, you'll see the category B conduct. And that's where we've added um, some, some new uh, law enforcement conduct, which is included in category B conduct. So category B conduct is gross unprofessional misconduct amounting to actions on duty or under color of authority or both. There's uh, that there's word that. color again. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we can, we can work with that. <clears throat> that involved willful failure to comply with a state required policy or a substantial deviation from professional conduct as defined by that law enforcement agency's poly, policy or by council policy and shall include. The first change you see is on line 19, um, subdivision C, excessive use of force under color of authority. There's that word again. I'm making a note um, of those places. Let's see what we can do there. So ex under existing law, this ex excessive use of force under color of authority is considered category B conduct only if it's a second offense, the law enforcement officer's second offense. So this changes it to um, category B conduct for if it's a first offense of excessive use of force. And this comes from, Senator White will correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's S-124. Um, yes. Bill that came yeah, out and so I'm confused here about whether we're going to put this in here because we're we've passed 124 and we're also looking at um, all of the issues around investigations and um, misconduct in GovOps so we just need to make sure we're doing the same thing because that's already on our agenda well just, the thing that we're trying to do here and we figure it out any way you want is make sure that a person who um, uses an improper restraint. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's added there's here. There's a criminal offense created in the next <clears throat> section, so this sets up that criminal offense when. Right. So this makes it unprofessional conduct to right. uh, to put a person in an improper restraint. Or to not intervene when an officer, another officer, is using unnecessary mm -hmm. force. Mm -hmm. that's so right. it, that's why it's here, I think, and and should be here because it sets up for a crime later on that's created. Um, uh, I, we can deal with it any way you want, Senator White. No, no, no. I just want. I just was surprised to see it here since. Um, yeah. We're already um, looking at it. So okay. okay. So the reason the reason I made that change here was um, because to make it consistent with what had already come out of your committee, Senator White, because you amended that section of law too. Sometimes when we've got multiple bills moving that amend the same section of law, we try and put the same changes in. 
Uh -huh. Oh, no, 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 I, I, I get that. I just, um, okay. okay, so, okay. Okay, sorry. I just want to be clear there about why yeah. that. Because we are looking at the way investigations are conducted and um, so. Okay. So I'll, I'm going to um, ask Peggy to scroll down to page 10 then. And this sorry. is where we add the new two, two new <laughs> conduct, law enforcement or law enforcement officer conduct that would constitute unprofessional conduct under category B. So the first is placing a person in an improper restraint, which we define further mm -hmm. down on line nine. Mm -hmm. Also subdivision G, failing to intervene when the officer observes another officer placing mm -hmm. a person in an improper restraint or using excessive force. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look down at line nine, there's the definition of improper restraint. You've seen that earlier in the bill. Use of any maneuver on a person that applies pressure to the neck, throat, windpipe, carotid artery that may prevent or hinder breathing, reduce intake of air, or impede the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain. Same definition you saw in the excessive, I'm sorry, deadly use of force policy in the, in the last section. But you're looking at that, right? To, um, for Senator Sears, who talked about um, pressure to the spine and stuff. Yeah, it sounds like maybe that covered by the serious bodily injury because the, the restraint would be improper, um, could be improper. I, the Woodside case involved, um, and I, I can't remember all the details, but I believe involved um, knee to the spine or the back. And that that would be uh, that was ruled by Judge Crawford improper restraint. Mm -hmm. So clearly, um, you, you already have a court ruling on that, and I want to make sure that it's not just the chokehold that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've made a note that that definition may need to be expanded throughout. <clears throat> so. Um, Section 2407 is a subchapter. This limits um, the council's ability to sanction an officer for a first offense of a cat of category B conduct. You'll see that first sentence existing law. If the council conducts an investigation of a complaint alleging that law enforcement can, um, committed a first offense of category B conduct, it directs the council to take no action. Um, so the new language here carves out that new category, those two new categories of category B conduct from that limitation. So the count it says specifically that the council can take action for a first offense of either placing a person in an improper restraint or failing to intervene if a, an officer witnesses another officer using excessive force or placing a person in an improper restraint. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I'm going to move on to section six now. And this is the, this is a new crime, it establishes a new crime of law enforcement use of improper restraint. Um, starts out by some definitions. Uh, these will look familiar. Law enforcement officer is defined the same way as it's defined earlier in the bill. That broad definition that I read to the committee. Um, serious bodily injury, you know, is defined already in statute. Improper restraint. I'll, I'll make a note that this definition may change, but this is the same definition you've seen throughout the bill. And um, it provides in subsection B that a law enforcement officer acting in the officer's capacity as law enforcement who employs an improper restraint on a person that causes serious bodily injury or death to the person shall be imprisoned for not more than 20 years or fined not more than $50,000 or both. Okay, I, I hope we get a real good definition of um, improper restraint. So, but I, I realize that there's a, a qualifier there that causes serious bodily injury. Um, but I think we, 20 years is pretty hefty. So I hope we get oh, a really I, good definition oh, of improper restraint. Thank you. Um, I d this was, um, totally my responsibility. Um, Bryn asked me uh, if we wanted to create a criminal offense. 
I said, for the purposes of this draft, to consider that, it's certainly up to the committee um, whether you include it or not. But I thought that at least for discussion, uh, when something is so egregious as what we saw in Minneapolis, um, that um, I know he's been charged with murder, and I suppose that could be, but um, it, it, the committee is certainly welcome to, to continue to look at this. I just put it in. So. It's not more than 20 years, though. Yeah, right. I, I realize that. I just, um, I would, I, I don't know, I would like to look at whether it already would be considered a crime. Certainly if they cause death, it could be, if it was, um, if it was considered improper, then they could be charged with manslaughter or murder or whatever. Oh. And uh, so I, I just want to make really uh, clear here. I, I'm not trying to defend them, but I want to make really I, clear that we know what we're talking about. I appreciate that. And I'm sure we'll hear um, testimony on this particular section, but I want to, I'll, I accept responsibility for it being here in the draft. I have a question about um, a place where I don't see an offense or a punishment, and that's the next section on body cameras. It says that body cameras shall be, um, shall be uh, functioning, um, but make sure that the device is recording whenever the officer is engaged in law enforcement. So there's a there's a law saying that it shall be done, but it doesn't make clear what happens. Uh, I think that's in 20 VSA 1818. I think we we passed that law a few years ago. Is there a, a penalty? I don't know, Bryn. There, there would be if it was um, if it was a category A, B, or C um, um, offense. There would be a penalty for it. It could be a sanction. It could be depending on the circumstances, it could be decertification. Um, it depends on what category it falls into um, in the... Do, would you like a copy of the act? Uh, well, yeah, the context around the body cameras would be good. Right. But, but I guess what I'm getting at is uh, we see this you know, again and again and again where there's a violent incident Bystanders say that the police used excessive force. We go to the body cameras and we find out that they weren't activated. If if the penalty is basically a, a professional penalty, a sanction or something like that, I think an officer going into a certain situation might choose to risk that as opposed to recording themselves committing what might be a crime. Um, so. In other words, I think we have to get more serious about the offense of not activating your body camera. Okay. So I can I just suggest uh, no, I that? Can I suggest that if if we make it a law that they have to use it, then it will be in it will be in the category A, B, or C from the training council, and there will be consequences, and it will depend on where we put it in the category A, B, or C, but there will be consequences. And being decertified is not um, a, just a slap on the hand. That means they can't ever practice as a law enforcement officer again. They may, um, anyway, I, I just wanna make sure that we don't get, um, boy, I'll, this is a very strange thing for me to be saying because if you had asked me this um, in the, 60s or early 70s, I would have told you you were crazy because I had very particular uh, phrases for law enforcement. But um, I think we need to make sure that we don't fall into responding to rhetoric and what's happening elsewhere. And I, I just, um, and I know this isn't exactly uh, what we're talking about right now, but I did a, a search of all the people who had been killed by police officers since 1977. And since 1977 in Vermont, there have been 20. And almost all of them involved aggravated domestic assault with hostages or with somebody um, fleeing and shooting at, at the police. So I, I just wanna make sure that we don't act 
in a way that um, that seems like we're we're um, responding to rhetoric and not to what's happening here. Well, I'm a little I'm a little nervous about the breadth of what this is saying. First off, whenever they're engaged in law enforcement activities, if they're sitting in the barracks filling out paperwork, that's a law enforcement activity. Mm -hmm. There are other situations, and I'm thinking now of Carl Draga up in um, Northumberland and Stewartstown and then crossing over the border into Vermont, mm -hmm. where he just walked in and started shooting. And does somebody have the ability to react and slap on a body camera uh, button instead of defending themselves from the immediate threat? Uh, it's one thing to say that if they purposefully toyed with or uh, purposefully did not turn on the microphone or the device when they should have. That's one thing, but I'm right. the breadth of what this is calling for is pretty wide. Well, yep. let, let's okay. I um, we're running out of time, but I also want to point out that um, what you don't have in front of you is the law that was passed in was it 2018, Bryn? <laughs> I think it was 2016. Uh, 2016 on the use of body cameras. So maybe we should refresh ourselves in that bill. If you could send out a copy to the committee of that law so that this, I'm not suggesting that we change it. My biggest thing is every member of the Vermont mm -hmm. Department of Public Safety should have, whose active duty should have a body camera when they're engaged in you know, whatever you want to call it, however you want to define it. Uh, maybe we just refer to the law, which has all the policies of when you turn it on, when you don't turn it on. And then we can talk about the consequences. But I, I, that's my big concern is we, we have been talking about state police having body cams for five years. I think it's time that they get them. And I believe we have the, uh, the commissioner of public safety will be talking with us tomorrow about it. And I believe there's a general agreement. So as long as they follow the law and we look at what the consequences are for not turning them on, that's fine with me. We can always suggest that law, but we should at least take a look at the law that we passed in 2016. We did also um, in, uh, I don't know if it was in the same bill or not, but um, I think maybe not, but we, required any um, department or any agent, law enforcement agency that is going to use body cameras or is going to use tasers to have a written policy on the use of them. So any anybody right. out there who's already using them has to have a written policy on right. their use. Well, I believe there's a model policy and then you can go beyond the model policy, but the model policy was the minimum. As I remember what we wrote on the body cameras. But I do know there's certain sections we did put in when you can use them and when you can turn them off because there were certain cases where police officer going into a home um, and you know becomes a public record and the concern about future break-ins to that home uh, for valuable artwork, for example. Then there was also a concern about victims of domestic violence particularly um, and that becoming a public record. So we did make some um, amendments there. Anyway, I, I think it would be great to review that. Okay, anything else on this draft? You see the effective date is the, uh, on the, um, the, the section on the, um, the original Baruth Bill 219 is effective January 1, 2021. So it does give them time to get the reports in. And section seven um, is August 1st, 2020. That's the video recording and the remaining sections are effective on passage. It's a good bill, Dick. It's got some tweaking to go, but it's a good bill. Thank you. I agree. You did a good job putting it all together in a short period of time. Certainly did. Yeah. All right. We'll see you all tomorrow morning at nine.